Here we're gonna investigate a really classic example involving Green's theorem, but before we do that, let's go ahead and recall what Green's theorem says. So let's say we've got a piecewise smooth, simple closed curve that's bounding a region D, and I should say it's positively oriented. That is, if you're walking along the curve, the region is to your left, and P and Q are two variable functions that have continuous first partials on an open set containing D, where we could also put them together into a vector field. F is uh, the vector field with component functions P and Q. Then the line integral over C of P dx plus Q dy is the same thing as the double integral over D of partial Q partial X minus partial P partial Y. And I should say that we can put this in vector form by noticing that the left hand side is the line integral over the vector field f dot dr, and on the right hand side it's the double integral of this two dimensional curl of f. Okay, so what we want to look at now is if we've got this vector field f, which is y over x squared plus y squared, comma, negative x over x squared plus y squared, what are all possible values of this line integral over C, where C satisfies all of these hypotheses of this vector field. So um, I wanna point out that there's some badness happening um, when you're at the origin, because notice that the component functions do not have first partials at the origin. So that means we cannot apply Green's theorem if our region contains the origin, which is going to mean that we have to take this into a couple of cases. Cases. So let's say case number one, and that would be the origin is not contained in D. So let's draw a little picture of that. So there's the origin, obviously, and now uh, let's draw maybe our curve C. So this would be our curve C. Notice I'm positively orienting it. Um, and then our region D is going to be everything inside here. And so now notice that we have the following. So in this case, we can take this line integral over C of f dot dr, and we can write that as the line integral over C of p dx q dy. So that's going to be y over x squared plus y squared dx minus x over x squared plus y squared uh, dy. So notice if we put this into the language of Green's theorem, uh, this is our component function p, and this is our component function q. Which means uh, we're going to want to put this uh, into a double integral, which we're allowed to do because these component functions, if you take their first partial, which we're about to do, we'll see that it's continuous on the entire plane except for this little pinprick at the origin. So uh, we want to replace this with the double integral dq dx minus partial p partial y. In other, in other words, the curl of this vector field. Okay, great. So now that's going to be the double integral over D of... So I won't go through all the details with these partial derivatives, but uh, needless to say, you've got to use the quotient rule and stuff like that. And what you'll end up with is negative y squared minus x squared over x squared plus y squared quantity squared plus y squared minus x squared over x squared plus y squared quantity squared. So that's what you end up with if you take those uh, partial derivatives, uh, dq dx and dp dy. But but notice that's just the double integral over d of zero dA, which is equal to zero. So notice, and this covers all cases when the origin is not contained in D. And in fact, that is because this thing is what's called a conservative vector field, which a conservative vector field means that it's path independent, which means that that means the line integral between any two points can be a, a, a that means the line integral between any two points can be evaluated by any path. So we might as well just take this single point right here 
and we could take the path going around the whole loop or the path that just stays right here. Well, obviously the path that just stays right here is going to give you zero, but since this is path independent, the path going around the whole loop is also going to give you a zero. And you might recall that um, being path independent is equivalent to having a potential function and you can actually find a potential function for this. I'll let you guys check, but if you take the gradient of the scalar function, um, arctan uh, x over y, you will get exactly this vector field. So, so there is a nice, simple potential function for this vector field as well. Um, okay, great. So I'm going to clean up the board, and then we'll look at the case when zero is contained in this region D. Okay, so we just covered the case when zero is... Okay, we just covered the case when the origin is not contained in the region D. Now we want to look at the case when the origin is contained in the region D. So I'll go ahead and mock up a picture of this. And uh, notice I can make kind of any sort of blob as long as it contains the origin like that. And so this is going to be my C, this curve here. Let's go ahead and positively orient it like this. Good, and then um, this region on the inside, which I'll shade in yellow, will be D. So notice we can't directly use Green's theorem for this um, just yet, but we can use Green's theorem um, in just a second to simplify this down to a much simpler problem. So what I want to notice is that uh, since C bounds a region D which contains the origin, what we can do is find some number a, which is a real number, actually it'll be a positive real number, so we might as well say that. So a positive real number, such that the disk of radius a, maybe we'll call that uh, dA at the origin, is completely contained within our region D. Okay. So let's go ahead and see what that looks like. So that means we can go out here, say this is A, we can draw a disc right here, and that whole disc, which I've shaded in blue, I'll underline this thing right here to uh, say that that is the disc of radius A as well. That's contained in this region D. Good. Now the next thing I want to do is let's call the boundary of this disc, let's give that a name. So let's call the boundary of this disk maybe uh, C hat. Okay, so uh, let's go ahead and write that over here. So the boundary of this disk of radius A, which I'll make a shorthand of just D sub A, let's call that uh, C hat. Great. Okay, good. And now if we positively orient this, then um, this blue region is on the inside of C. Now, the next thing that we want to notice is that uh, the origin is not inside this disk after we remove dA. Great. And so, uh, let's draw what part of the picture that is. <clears throat> so, maybe we'll put that in purple. So, I'll underline this in purple. And this region out here which I'm shading in purple, does not contain the origin. Notice what it is, it's everything between my big orange blob and my circle of radius A. Okay, good. So, um, what that means is that if we get a handle on what the boundary curve is for this, we know that we can apply green... We know that we can apply case one to that. So uh, let's see what the boundary curve of that is. So let's uh, um, also notice that the boundary curve of D minus DA, in other words, this purple region right here, is given by our curve C, which is the one we started with. And then I'm going to put um, union then our curve C hat, but I need to put that with a minus sign, which means I'm orienting it the opposite way. 
Okay, and then by case one, what that tells me is that the line integral over C union minus C hat of F dot dr equals zero. Because this satisfies the hypotheses of Green's theorem, and remember for case one, we were able to apply Green's theorem to something like this in order to get um, this line integral being zero. Great, but then on the other hand, we can rip this thing apart, this left-hand side apart, into the line integral over C of F dot dr, and then plus the line integral over minus C hat of F dot dr, and we see that that is equal to zero. Okay, great. But now, the line integral over minus C hat, which is C hat parametrized in reverse, is the same thing as negative the line integral over C hat, where C hat is parametrized in the correct way. So really, we've got the line integral over C minus this line integral over C hat equals zero. But you can see where we're going. Notice that immediately tells us that the line integral over C of F dot dr is equal to this line integral over C hat of F dot dr. Great. Where C hat is just this circle of radius A. Okay, great. So now that we have that, I'll clean up the board and we'll do the calculation. So on the last board, we argued that our line integral over C of f dot dr, if d contains the origin, is equal to the line integral over C hat of f dot dr, where C hat is a circle of radius A centered at the origin. Okay, great. So now let's go ahead and parametrize a circle of radius A centered at the origin, and then we can calculate this line integral um, directly. So that can be given by R of t, which equals A cos t, uh, A sine t, where um, t runs between 0 and 2 pi. Great. And so we've parametrized circles before, so I won't labor that too much, but that's what we get for this. Okay, and now we can just apply the formula for this line integral over a vector field, and that's going to be give us the integral from 0 to 2 pi of, so f with this plugged in, so that's uh, going to be equal to uh, a sine t over a squared, because notice x squared plus y squared is a squared, given the fact that this is our our x component, this is our y component, and then we're going to have uh, minus a cos t over a squared, kind of for the same reason. Great. And now we need to dot that with r prime, uh, but let's notice that in this setup we have a very simple formula for r prime as well. That's going to be minus a uh, sine t and then a cosine t, just taking the derivative with respect to t. So that is going to give us minus a sine t, a cos t, and then we have dt. Great. And now taking that dot product, so we need to multiply this component with this component, and we need to multiply this component with that component, and then add them, just the definition of the dot product. Notice that is going to give us the integral from 0 to 2 pi of negative sine squared t. Notice the a times a on the top cancel the a squared on the bottom, minus cosine squared t. Again, the a's cancel dt. But notice, uh, negative sine squared minus cosine squared is just negative 1, which means we're integrating negative 1 from 0 to 2 pi, which gives us a final answer of minus 2 pi. Okay, great. Now, I'm going to clean up the board. Okay, so that means that as long as you have a simple closed curve that's wrapping around the boundary, this line integral is always going to give you negative 2 pi. So I'm actually going to clean up the board and we're going to wave our hands at a more general case before we're done. Okay, so for our last case, which we're going to wave our hands at, we're going to look at what if C is not simple. In other words, C is self-intersecting. And this is going to depend something about how it's wrapping around the origin. So let's just draw an example of C. So let's maybe make this 
one C that we could look at like that. So notice that's definitely not a simple curve. Um, and then let's orient that guy this way. So oriented in a counterclockwise orientation. So let's say that's our C. But notice we can decompose this into a union of closed curves. So uh, let's maybe say that this one right, we could... So we could make a point right there, and then this could be one of our curves, just this little loop. So this is maybe C1, and then we could make a point right here, and then this uh, thing right here is C2, and then what's left over, uh, we'll just call that a C3. Great. And now notice, if we have this set up, the line integral over C of f dot dr is going to be equal to the line integral f dot dr over C1 plus the line integral f dot dr over C2 plus the line integral f dot dr over C3. Okay, and then we can just apply case one or case two to all of those. So notice, uh, if we're going around C1, that loops around the origin, so we get a negative two pi for that. Then if we're going around C2, well that does not loop around the origin, so we get a zero for that. And then finally, if we're looping around C3, so notice C3 goes like this, that does loop around the origin, so we get another negative 2 pi for that. So in the end, we get a negative 4 pi. So maybe I'll clean up the board and we'll look at one more kind of generalization of this. Okay, so for our last example, we'll look at another case when C is not simple. Um, so let's maybe say we have uh, the curve wrapping around the origin a couple of times. So let's say our curve does something like this. Great. So now, uh, let's say we can decompose this again. So maybe we could take this as one of the cut points and we'll take this to be one of the component curves. And then next, we could take this right here to be one of the cut curves. And then finally, we could take this one on the outside to be the last of the curves. And so we've decomposed this into three curves that all wrap around the origin. So notice here, we have the line integral over C of f dot dr is going to be the sum of the line integral over C1 plus C2 plus C3, but each of those go around the origin, so we get 3 times minus 2 pi. In other words, we get minus 6 pi. And in general, I think what we're uh, getting at is that um, if C wraps the origin n times, the line integral over C of f dot dr is going to be minus 2n pi. And uh, this n is sometimes called the winding number. Okay, that's a good place to stop.